have in packets and broadcast them to neighboring nodes. And in this case, uh, we get a gain of 50%. It's easy to see. And it's called reverse carpooling in the literature. And the idea is that if you go in one direction, you can get a different direction almost for free. Because, um, of course, you need to consider overhead. And it's uh, um, kind of a theoretical game. But people, uh, I will mention a little bit later, actually built practical system and demonstrated that this will give some advantage if you believe there are simulations. Right? But um, uh, we need to. Um, it's kind of has a potential at least uh, what I'm kind of trying to convince here. Right? And, uh, and this opens up a lot of problems. As I mentioned, for example, before we treat these networks, if you look on a network and we um, ask a question how much information can this network relay, we use a notion of multi-commodity flows. Right? So we have different flows, and those flows don't really interact with each other, and we just need to separate those flows, so is there a different amount of bandwidth for each flow? And uh, within tradition of this network, or you can use this network as wireless, and we know that if we go in one direction and we can get another direction for free, this changes the picture, right? So it's no longer multi commodity flow, right? Because the two flows in opposite direction, they don't need twice capacity, they just need uh, uh, the same capacity, uh, just maximum capacity. And um, so capacity of the whole network will be different. Also, the way we route packets in the network might change, right? Because for example, we need to steer uh, flows that will go exactly and take the same path because otherwise we cannot utilize uh, this uh, kind of, we cannot leverage this advantage of network coding if all the school nodes in opposite direction will go and uh, different way. Okay, so this is uh, again, again, it's a research project, for example, how to ensure that routing fully utilizes and we actually getting gain from this reverse Any questions so far? Yeah, so another interesting question if you look at my relay problem is the scheduling problem, right? So, and it's actually lies in a very interesting area of intersection of coding and queuing. And recently it was a lot of interest in this uh, area because it's kind of uh, nice because we need to utilize uh, tools from different disciplines. And um, in this case, it's kind of considering the practical uh, scenario, practical constraints that you cannot really utilize uh, network coding if uh, not all of the SKUs are full, right? So suppose here if this node N2 sends packets to N1 and N1 sends to N2, so all packets to N2 will be stored in this queue, and packets to N1 will be stored in this queue, right? And then when uh, uh, relay node has an opportunity to transmit, so suppose there is some algorithm, uh, scheduling algorithm that decides which node will transmit at uh, which point of time, so this relay node will look on those queues, and uh, if those queues are not empty, right, so both of them, right, so they just take the packets from top of those queues, mix them together, just XOR them, in this case, coding is kind of trivial, right, it's not really, uh, and we'll see more complicated examples, right, but um, here, uh, yeah, so if both of the queues are not empty, just send an XOR of those packets. But what happens if one of the queues is empty, right? So then we have two, two um, ways to proceed. One is just to wait, right, and decide, OK, maybe packets will come later, and I will just wait for next what we call coding opportunity. Uh, or I can just send uncoded packets, right? And of course, there is a trade-off, right? So if I decide to wait, I'm increasing delays, but, um, but I'm better utilizing broadcast uh, medium, right? So I'm kind of uh, maybe giving opportunity to other nodes to transmit in the network. If I'm deciding to send uh, without coding, I'm not really using, uh, leveraging fully network coding, right? So I'm sending, I'm ending up making more transmissions, but my waiting time will be low, right? So again, an interesting problem, and um, of course, like it's just a toy example, but in general, you have a lot of opportunity here to analyze those systems uh, using tools of queuing queuing theory, right? And uh, and basically, sometimes just problem of select appropriate codes that will behave very well and kind of strike the trade off between delay and number of transmission and the run right for. Okay, uh, so Daniela talked a little bit about physical air network coding, so I will not talk about this in this uh, talk, uh, but um, in general what you can do, you can basically even have more aggressive and say why you need to send those packets separately, let's send them in the same time slot and let them mix in the air, right, so receiver will receive some kind of uh, combination of those packets, not modulo 2, but some kind of uh, 
a real addition, right? There's some noise, of course, I'm hiding here a lot of things, but uh, the idea is that basically we transmit simultaneously, and the uh, relay uh, doesn't have to know, right, each individual packet, because the relay is just helping, right? So relay, uh, it's not interesting in any MP, and in some way we even want to hide this from relay, right? So for example, if we want to introduce some aspect of security, right? So we don't want relay even to know MP, right? So suppose we want to kind of relay to be uh, kind of oblivious to what we're doing, right? And uh, we can do it at the same uh, period of time, and relay can try to uh, decode not A and B separately, but some combination of A plus B. So, and uh, basically, it even doesn't matter. It, it really even kind of this works on physical area of coding. It really can decide which combination to choose, like whatever is convenient, subject to all this physical area coding. Right? And then uh, once it's tried to decode uh, this combination, it can broadcast it back. Again, it's kind of uh, started the entire new area of physical area network coding. And it's a lot of recent work and very, very interesting work. But Daniela, I kind of assume it covered everything, but most of it. Okay. Uh, so as I mentioned, the idea of physical air network coding, and it's actually one of the two applications most promising for network coding, uh, which uh, wireless networks and distributed storage. So we'll have a distributed storage section later on. I also want to talk about this. Uh, but in wireless network coding, uh, so in wireless communication, uh, uh, the advantage of network coding, as I mentioned, it can uh, utilize this broadcast property. And uh, it was very nice work of kind of practical people from MIT or Kina Katabi and her team trying to leverage this, right? So an idea was that uh, if not a broadcast a packet, right, all other nodes in the close vicinity of this uh, transmitter can basically uh, obtain this packet, right? So, um, so they can overhear a uh, wireless channel and just kind of store this overheard packets for some period of time. So for example, here, suppose this node is kind of a multi hop network sending this green packet to this node, and this node sends packets to this node. And uh, those are packets that are kind of involved in this communication, so they uh, kind of belong to this path from source to destination node. But in addition, all those nodes uh, here, uh, they will overhear this packet and store this packet for some period of time. So if we allow this, right, so uh, we kind of allow those nodes that um, uh, in close vicinity of those transmitters to obtain some side information, right? So they basically over here some packets they can potentially use in the future to improve the performance of the network. And the advantage of network coding, we can actually leverage the side information to actually reduce the number of transmissions. Okay, and um, so uh, as I mentioned, this uh, paper, and it's a lot of interest in what I will describe index coding came from this, motivated by this entirely practical paper. So they just implemented the system and see it's kind of cool that we can record those packets, we have the site information. Let's try to build a system that actually utilizes and measures platform. And so in their work, what the idea was that uh, basically, it should be H0, they'll store some overheard packets for some short period of time. It was half a second. And uh, in addition, we need to kind of let other neighbors know, the neighbor if not know what you store. And, um, and this can be done through special mechanisms that I will kind of describe briefly later. And, uh, and this side information can somehow be leveraged through use of network. So let's see on this example how it can be leveraged. So suppose we have a sender in the middle that has four packets. And those four packets need to be sent to different clients, right? And each client will associate it with two sets. One is we called once set, or a kind of set of required packets. For example, this node will require P4, and this node will require P3, and P1, and P2. So we have those four packets, and they need to be sent to those four nodes separately. In addition, we have the side information, which is kind of uh, noted here by Hess. And those are basically overheard packets. Those are packets that um, we did in previous picture here. Right? Those are packets that uh, those nodes store as a side information. And uh, as um, I mentioned before, this node has some kind of a way to notify this node what kind of site information is stored. And again, it's practical paper that's actually implemented. Any questions? Right, so now in this system, right, so when we have a relay, we have a node that, again, uh, each of the nodes wants some of the packets and uh, has some site information. And suppose this node has knowledge of what other people want. It's definitely um, true from some routing algorithm, it makes sense. But also, it will have some information about what other nodes store. 
And now we can see that uh, this node can uh, combine those packets, right? Instead of those setting those packets separately, this node can um, reduce the number of transmission by sending combinations of those packets, right? So for example, here, if you send P1 plus P4, this node can uh, decode the packet it needs, but it can also be helpful for other nodes. I will see a more detailed example to show the number of transmission can actually be reduced. And this is, uh, again, problems that arise from a very, very practical setting. Uh, for example, this one. But it's simple enough and elegant enough that it's arise in many other uh, you can imagine, uh, like actually it was uh, rediscovered. It was uh, initially um, formulated by people actually from Technion in 97 in the context of satellite communication, but people didn't pay much attention until all the field of network coding was uh, evolved recently. Okay, so just kind of a little couple of words about practical implementation. So a system is called COP, and uh, it sends uh, all nodes in kind of listening mode and not snoop off this communication and store those packets for a short period of time, but also they send uh, reception reports to its neighbors, and this is done without introducing like, additional transmissions, they just annotate packets at the same anyway. So in most of the cases, the site information, the knowledge about site information, it doesn't come with a much extra cost, but of course, we have some cases in which not transmits no data, in this case, it can periodically send some reception report via special messages. <coughs> of course, it has some problems as any practical implementations. Uh, those reception reports can be lost, can arrive later, and this is basically dealt with this problem. And sometimes, uh, to, uh, it's actually another interesting problem that in my view was not investigated well enough. So sometimes the knowledge of site information is not precise because of those practical constraints that reception reports can be lost. So in many cases, what they proposed, but they didn't really analyze it, or didn't propose any algorithms that's so optimal in any sense, um, they can uh, infer the site information, right? So they basically assign some probability. So I believe that this node should have the site information because it typically has, or it's located to uh, close to the sender, so it should have it. Or uh, basically, it's an entire work here that can be done and kind of trying to see who knows what, right? And the more accurate we have the knowledge about site information, the more better algorithms we have. Because if we have a mistake in site information, we actually can, um, as a performance of uh, the index coding scheme, can be really affected. Okay, and uh, what they propose is called opportunistic coding. So I'm looking on uh, site information of uh, my neighbors. I'm looking what I need to send. And I'm trying to basically code opportunistically, and what they suggested, okay, let's just try to find a linear combination just using simple code, exclusive or over GF2, and let's just try to kind of maximize the, max, uh, the maximum number of neighbors to make them happy in one transmission. And this is basically a very, very simple case. Um, okay, and of course, like, there's another practical problem that packets can be on different plans. But it turns out that in practical networks, uh, we have like a distribution have two peaks. We have all very small packets or very large packets. And we can basically separate them both. OK, so another motivation of this index coding program right, came from um, heterogeneous wireless networks. And we know that today's uh, devices, uh, oh, I mentioned yesterday that you do this when people are uh, going to sleep, right? <laughs> Like interesting conversation with Marcel about how to use those controls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not um, radical. <laughs> okay, so in heterogeneous wireless networks, so everybody today pretty much has a smartphone or so some kind of devices, and they usually have two interfaces, right? So we have local interface, which is Wi Fi, or can be Bluetooth, and we uh, have also cellular interface. So cellular interface is usually more expensive. And, um, uh, but local interface is usually cheaper, right? And uh, in today's network, they actually operate, uh, and you can see that uh, in some cases, as, uh, uh, there might be maybe a case here for index coding, right? In which, for example, the node uh, sends information to multiple um, users, right? But some of the users can lose some of the buckets. And now the reception as a uh, base station can try to correct those errors, but not trying to do this to each, users individually, to each user individually, but trying to kind of send packets that would be helpful to multiple users. 
And of course, that's those users, they can have uh, packets that they want, and they have some side information because they can overhear something. And they can achieve a significant gain if uh, we basically uh, try to broadcast some combination and satisfy all those. So you can see that some application here um, of index coding can be found in this setting as well. OK, so let's try to focus now on this index coding setting. And, um, and here we idealize many things to make this problem simple and beautiful. But as I mentioned, like in practical setting, it's not as nice. But uh, the first step to analyze is kind of just make a lot of simplifying assumptions and trying to see uh, what we can do from a more theoretical perspective how to deal with it. So again, uh, in this problem, we have a sender that knows everything. It's also very important that sender has access to all packets in the system. And we have users that kind of split, like each user has two subsets, one subset of required packets, and one set of side information packets. So without much loss of generality, we can assume that each user requires only one packet. So why we can assume that? Because we can just split, like for example, if user requires two packets, we can just split it into different users, so three or four, right? Uh, and uh, those users will have the same, same side information. So it's clear that it's kind of easy to verify that it doesn't change the problem. So now for simplicity, we assume that each user requires just a single packet. Okay, and it's has many packets, it can have many packets that the side information set. Okay, so again, there's a problem. We have a set of packets and set of clients. And again, this problem, I'm sorry, was not 97, 98, first formulated, but people kind of rediscovered later on in a different context. And actually, in this work, it's again was done by more system people, and they call it ISCOD, and uh, they did it in terms of kind of in the setting of satellite communication. The satellite need to broadcast some movies, uh, and they have some low rate backup, backend channels that just people tell what they have and what they need and trying to uh, basically minimize the transmission from the satellite to try to kind of, uh, and those files considered to be large, so we want to minimize the number of transmissions that needs to be made from this bottleneck channel. Okay, so is the setting clear? Because uh, if this problem is not clear, so we kind of totally lost the much more next hour. Okay, uh, so again, we have set of required packets. I will just put it in the upper side and set of side information, so the lower side. And, um, and the goal is to find an encoding scheme that minimizes, uh, satisfies all, all clients with minimum number of transmissions. And of course, we can do it in a trivial way by just ignoring side information, just send those four packets separately, uh, right? Ignoring all broadcast property side information, what probably practical people would do, right? But um, um, in general, right, we can optimize this by sending combinations. And in this particular example, we can say again, 50% of transmissions by sending two, two packets, and again, it's very simple code over GF2, P1 plus P2, P2, P1 plus P4, and P2 plus P3, and you can see that everybody can decode out of those two transmissions. So this one can decode P1, um, because it's knows P4, so it can substitute from this transmission, right? And this transmission will also satisfy this one, because it needs P4 and has P1, and P2 plus P3 will satisfy this client, and this one, right? So we just do transmission, we'll make everybody pay. So in general, it's, uh, this is a um, uh, problem is called scalar coding, right? So as I mentioned, those packets, you can think about it to um, kind of justify this large overhead that you might have on relaying those side information. You can consider those packets to be pretty large packets, right? So, and like it's kind of think about movies or some media clips and stuff like that. Uh, so in general, it might be possible um, to split those packets in the multiple sub packets, right? So if it's like megabytes of data, we usually communicate with a smaller packet. So in this case, we can, yes? Uh, how are they going to have the side information that the is? Side information, right? How do you know they're going to have the side information that the is? Yeah, yeah. So I kind of mentioned that this, this paper addressed uh, this problem, right? So basically what they have, they have reception reports. So basically when this node transmits something, it can basically say, by the way, right? It's kind of annotating, right? So it's kind of using some data rate. And it's, of course, that requires some system, right? Those packets, but it can say, by the way, I have those packets, right? And also in some cases it can be inferred, right? So that uh, this user has it, right? Yeah, it's again, it uh, depends on particular settings, right? So in this wireless settings, they introduce this entire protocol 
and to send those reception reports and buy annotating packets. And the satellite settings, they said like, okay, you just call and say, you have some backend channel and say, uh, okay, I need this movies, but I have those movies, right? And uh, the idea, as I mentioned, to justify this overhead, those files need to be large, right? So by transmitting those files, which are kind of megabytes, like movies, right, you can waste a little bit to kind of let sender know, right? So but it's, those originally have the packets no, uh, just originally, this, what we require is for the sender, if I understood your question correctly, so the sender needs to know who, who has what, right? So it has perfect awareness in the system. Right? This is a good question, right? Yeah, like, I get where it says, uh, you know that node has a key to right. from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as I said, there is a mechanism, right? So when uh, this node transmits, so basically not only is this node transmits, this node also gets to transmit, right? So when it transmits, it annotates, right? It says, like, in, in addition to what it's supposed to transmit, right? And if you have, like, wireless network, all nodes periodically transmit something, right? So when they transmit, they also broadcast as a part of this packet, right? They basically say, okay, I have those packets aside. Right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, this code has the same foundation before this transmission. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, you can kind of consider as a continuous system, nodes get transmitted kind of periodically, and uh, basically I'm kind of looking just on a simple snapshot of this, and this one is amazing. The idea that P2 is much bigger than the information that you Yeah, have. it's kind of why it's called index coding, right? So basically we kind of sending indices, right? And those overhead of sending indices, as mentioned, that it's much less than sending packets, right? So it's just a very small piece of information as well, compared to the size of the packet and the large. Yeah, but it's kind of, as I mentioned, sometimes you need to guess, right? And it's an interesting question, which, as I said, I like, was not really investigated very much. So what if I don't have a precise knowledge, right? What if I just guesstimate, right? Estimate, right? So if I'm just saying, OK, is this not, uh, I got, like, as a relay, I got P4 from some sender, and, and the sender located close to node 1, so then this is kind of reasonable to assume that when I get this, this not also gets it, right? Especially it's true when it's uh, kind of mesh network that nodes don't move. Uh, but I mentioned like this problem is interesting by itself, so it's kind of not a problem for particular settings that can be kind of encountered in many other settings. And we will show in the future connection to more general uh, network points. Okay, any other questions here? Okay, and as I mentioned, like, uh, instead of using scalar codes, right, so you can in general divide those packets into smaller sub-packets. And, um, and basically then mix, instead of mixing um, packets, we mix those sub-packets and we can do it in a different way. For example, we can mix packet 1, 1, 1, this packet, like, for example, 2, 2, right? So we don't have to mix the corresponding packets. And of course, it's complicated, it's a little bit of overhead, right, and of course, Nobody asks how I communicate this as a coded packet. This is another practical problem, right? So nobody jumped on that, right? But um, kind of feel free to ask questions, right? So how do we know that this packet is P1, P2 plus P3, right? And it's again done by, it's actually easy to do, right? So just have a small overhead also in the beginning of the packet and say, this is a coded packet. This is not P1, P2, but just have uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, right? You just say it's mixture of P2. Right. So if you do vector linear coding, the overhead will increase, uh, but the uh, number of transmissions will decrease, obviously, because it kind of corresponds to a fractional case. So we have more flexibility in this case. So this will be fractional coding. And for fractional coding, like, for example, if we divide each code in k symbols, so here is k is equal to 3. In scalar case, k is equal to 1. So we need to normalize transmission rate. So for transmission rate, right, because we have more transmissions, but each transmission will be smaller. So we divided mu by k for uh, scalar coding, uh, so for vector linear coding, and transmission rate, if you want to kind of information theory, usually kind of minimize instead of maximize. Uh, so maximize instead of minimize, so you can kind of maximize k over mu if you don't want to minimize mu over k. Okay. okay. Right, okay. So this is, um, okay. Uh, this is basically a possible coding. And actually, interestingly enough, you don't even uh, have to use linear coding, right? So you can think about why use linear, why maybe you use nonlinear coding, right? So this thing like nonlinear coding will get an advantage in this thing. So 
how many people think that uh, scalar coding uh, is optimal? Uh, that uh, linear coding is optimal? Okay. How many people think that nonlinear coding is optimal? Okay. So what other people think? <laughs> Think about other type of coding? <laughs> 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 yeah, so it turns out actually is a paper people who first formulated this problem, they have a big mistake of uh, conjecturing that uh, linear coding actually will be helpful. And other people will be glad to prove that actually nonlinear coding has advantage in some settings, right? So uh, again, like this is kind of non-typical what you see, it's kind of more like a computer science type problem. And which uh, you have really, you don't need to design a code, but more like an algorithm, right, to, to create the code. Because the code will be different for different settings, right? So it's not like in channel coding, you're creating a code in your data, right? So maybe like for different channels, you need to create a different code. But here, the code will depend, as you can imagine, on the side information, right? So instead of coming up with a particular code, right, that will work universally, which is probably will be suboptimal, you know, probably do something much, right? Which might be also an interesting problem, kind of try to find the code for some uh, uh, group of those instances. But in general, if you want to be optimal, you need to look on specific instance, right, and design a code, right? So basically, you're not looking for uh, code design, you're looking for algorithm, right, that will decide the code. So if you go to the Turing movie, right, so you cannot build a machine with a human. So you need to kind of create an algorithm. Yeah. Uh, just a question. The last question I asked you, but we need to find, um, like, minimize the rent. Yeah. So, um, sort of, what's the minimum complexity that can be achieved? Yeah, it's exactly the problem, right? So, it's exactly what kind of we'll be focusing today. And uh, the problem is basically how to construct those combinations, right? So, here, like, and that's uh, answering the question, for example, is this the best possible, right? or not, right, uh, can we construct a better code? Probably here you can see this is pretty much optimal, right? Yeah. But you need some tools to uh, say, like, how to design a code. And uh, again, like, it's a great question, right? Once you uh, talk about algorithm, right, it's maybe complex, right? So it's maybe anti part and unfortunately it's anti part in this case, right? So it's, um, it shouldn't deter us from uh, investigating it, right? Because uh, typically, in practical settings, this might be not that many nodes, but it's also interesting to characterize complexity of this and to relate this problem to us. Any other questions? And again, like uh, we are assuming here that the broadcast channel is lossless. So nobody asked about this, right? It's also kind of simplifying consumption, or we can basically uh, rely to some people in physical layer to take care of it. Okay, um, so we also can consider this problem for two types, and one is called multiple unicast, in which uh, each packet is uh, requested by exactly one receiver, right? So you can say at most one, but if it's not requested, you can just discard it, right? So here you see that each client requests a different packet. And this is multiple multicast case in which a client can be requested by multiple clients. So it turns out there is some distinction between them, but then it's for sure those problems will be equivalent in terms of complexity. So if you find algorithm for one, we can find algorithm for others. And that actually brings another question of equivalence between different classes of programs. And that's kind of uh, came also from computer science, what they like to do in complexity theory, right? So you can say, like, if I can solve this, right, if I establish algorithm for this problem, I can actually use this algorithm to solve a completely different problem that looks, in this case, problems look similar. But in general, those problems don't have to look similar. They can use, describe complete, using completely different development in a completely different way. But we can make a reduction from one problem to another. And then algorithms that solve one problem will actually solve another problem. And it's other way around. So it was very successful in computer science to try to understand how those problems relate to each other and establish relations. And actually, we will see here that this problem, one of the reasons why this problem is interesting, because it basically can describe much more general network coding. Right? The network coding problem is much harder to describe it has network topologies and stuff like this. But it turns out that this much more sophisticated network coding problem can be encoded into this problem. So you say you say equivalent to exact or is it is it is an approximation? Yeah, it's not approximation. It's kind of uh, if you're talking about the size of the optimal solution, it will not be the same. You kind of it's kind of different problems for you. Yes, but you map. 
multicast problem is some unique cast problem and show that how you can solve it there. But then you could map it back to multicast. This is the optimal or this is the ratio, approximate ratio of the so, so for optimal, yes. So it's basically if you solve uh, this problem optimally, you will solve network coding optimally. Right. Yeah. But it's not yeah, yeah. It's kind of but it's not approximation ratio preserving. So if you have an approximation algorithm, yes. I mean, it's not necessarily so yeah, but, uh, yeah. Optimality. 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 Okay. It's kind of like exactly like in computer science, you reduce vertex cover. Yeah, but they're, they're looking for this polynomial time, polynomial time. Yeah, they it's polynomial time. time. Yeah, but they don't care about the exact polynomial, like the best uh, not to do the polynomial time. Right? I mean, no, no, it's exactly like that. So the optimal might be different, right? So basically, optimal from uh, net, uh, network coding can be A. Yeah, but, you, you say, but uh, if I can solve this, I can solve this optimal. You mean like the optimal for the traffic sales, but you may not be able to be optimal preset. The constant may not be able to be. Maybe just that if you can solve one phone number type, it's on that phone number. Oh, I think I know. Here I think it's optimal. Right? Yes, there's a difference. Sure, sure. We will like, talk about this reduction later on. Okay, so, um, so for multiple unicast case, we can actually represent this problem um, by way of a graph, right? So actually it's many representations you can kind of think about uh, how I basically represent this problem. It's going to be represented in hypergraph and people use this. But one of the simplest way for multiple unicast, because multiple unicast, each packet is requested for exactly one client. So there is a correspondent between a client and the packet that's requested, right? So in this case, we can just think about it like as a one-to-one -one correspondent. So in this case, we can represent this problem as a graph. And that uh, will be, in general, directed graph. And in this case, uh, for example, um, uh, each node or each packet, right? Since it's exact, a uh, one-to-one correspondence will be the same. Each packet will be represented by a node of this graph. For example, uh, this node P4 will be represented by a node here, which is kind of packet P4 inside it. And site information will be represented by R. So, for example, if this client has site information about P3, it will be run, uh, R from P4 to P3. Okay? And uh, the same here, for example, for P3, it has kind of side information about two packets, P2 and P4, right? And um, so we have arcs from P3 to P2, uh, from P3 to P2, and from P3 to P4, right? So once we make this uh, correspondence between an uh, instance of this problem and the graph, basically all information is already encoded in this graph, right? So we can kind of basically forget about the instance and just reason about this problem by the way of the graph, right? Okay, and, uh, and in this graph, for example, if we're looking on this, we can clearly see the lower bound, right, on the number of transmissions. And this lower bound on number of transmissions is basically called maximum induced acyclic subgraph. And it kind of sounds complicated, but it's just maximum subset of nodes that are not connected by a cycle, right? And the intuition is like, first of all, I don't know we should have said, that if this graph doesn't contain any cycle, so basically, all of advantage that uh, coding has here because of the cycles in this graph, right? So if this graph has no cycles, if it's a cyclic side graph, it's very easy to see that coding doesn't really help, right? So, and cycles really help because uh, if you look on the structure of the graph, you see that, for example, here, you see like why the solution was chosen as it was chosen, right? For example, if I'm sending P4 plus P3, kind of uh, this uh, coding not will correspond to what we kind of fully connected subgraph or click. So any click can be satisfied with one transmission, right? Because click, all client, all nodes on this click knows kind of uh, packets that are uh, required by other nodes, right? So if you just mix all those packets together, you can satisfy all nodes in this click by just one transmission. So one of the heuristic, right, is not necessarily optimal solution for index coding as we'll see. It's just by kind of dividing this graph and it's called click color. Uh, of this graph, and this idea is to um, cover this graph by a minimum number of clicks, right? And hopefully, like, concept of graph everybody knows, right? So it's something like, not use very deep cons uh, kind of uh, concept of graphs. Okay, so, and we see that because of this, clicks exist because of the cycles, right? So if graph is fully acyclic, we cannot really do anything, right? Because what we send, the idea of coding is basically trying to send coded packets that will help multiple clients, right? But if there is no cycle, so nobody kind of, I cannot really intuitively, right? So it's very easy to prove formally, but intuitively you can say that without cycles, I cannot really uh, satisfy multiple. Okay. So this graph is evolving with time to understanding things, and the idea would be to try to maximize the number of clicks so that you 
and I start solving it just by saying one to these guys, one to these guys. And you think it, a little bit ahead, I'm kind of considering it notable, right? Oh, so it's okay. just a static. Yeah, of course you can update graph, but you basically, as you mentioned, right, in practical setting, actually, it's a dynamic problem. Right? Right. Each time the, he broadcasts, the graph changes. Right, right, right. But, but it's, it retains the, 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 the previous knowledge, so you just add things. Yeah, they already know what is sent before, right? You can remove this clip, right? But it doesn't really help you, right? Oh, I thought like you are looking for the case and which new packets are out. Right, right, right. It's not the case here, right? So, yeah. Yeah, we can consider completely static settings, so just graph. Do click cover of the graph and something like And click cover is not necessarily optimal solution, but at least we have some kind of lower bound. Yeah. Can you go through the same number of JNCs? Yeah. 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 Yeah
here. So how is this problem really relates to index squared? Think about this. Right, the scalar linear case, yeah. So I'm claiming that uh, mean rank, and uh, again, like the rank also will depend on the, on the uh, field size, right? So of course, like for different field sizes, if you restrict it to GF2, you can achieve certain mean rank, but in kind of if you have a flexibility work on a larger field, the rank can potentially be lower, but not necessarily. Everything depends on particular instance of this problem. Again, we kind of it's more like an algorithm, right? Because we can consider classes of those matrices, right? Okay, and um, uh, so how is this is related to um, index coding program? Yes, if you didn't know this before, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I knew this. Um, okay. okay. You send you send the VS, you send those vectors which have span the vectors, and specific. then. These are the low decay the places where you know those things, so you can always remove them and get the one back. Okay. Next time we'll find it. Students. <laughs> no, uh, no, it's fine. Yeah, it's actually perfect sense, right? So, and, um, uh, so the idea here is that each row will be represented by, uh, so each row will represent the client and actually put him here if you want to do, right? So instead of vertex as a graph, it will be a row in this matrix, right? And if you're looking for client P1, it's basically kind of uh, put a restriction what we should have in linear space. So when we solve this problem, we're actually not finding uh, specific packets, we're just sending some basis of a linear space, right? So uh, because uh, once we have those two vectors, each client can obtain any other vector in this linear space, right? So I don't necessarily have a unique solution, right? I can send uh, first of all, like the space is not necessarily unique, right? But I can send any basis of this space, right? Not necessarily this one, right? For example, I can send P1 plus P3, and I can send like some of these packets, like which will give you P1 plus P2 plus P3 plus P4, right? Because that's kind of what is important is a subspace. And each client will impose some constraints in this space, right? Because each client will pick one vector from this subspace, right? And then use the side information to substitute and kind of kill some vectors in this, um, some packets in the subspace to obtain the packet that means, right? So for example, if you look at this is an example which is in some sense too simple, but this client uses just this vector, right? And uh, this client will just use this vector, right? And now it's basically everybody uses a vector from the base, but in general, it can use some linear combination of those, right? It can kind of perform some decoding multiply this by some vector, get some, uh, you know, extract some vector of the subspace, and then uh, have, uh, kind of obtain the packet of these. So in some sense, this uh, min rank representation is basically kind of uh, based on this intuition, right? So if you're looking on the first, right, uh, client, it's basically saying, and it's kind of slightly different from the this, but um, this client basically has, it requires P1, and has P2 and P4 as side information. And it's basically saying in this subspace, I must have a vector that have a something non-zero. It must be like, you can put one without loss of generality, but it must be something non-zero in this P1. And it might have a component of P2 and P4, but it shouldn't have any component of P3 because I don't know P3, right? So if you're sending P3, it's actually I will not be able to decode it, right? But it's, uh, so it's basically you'll have like P1 plus something times P2, and doesn't have to do it, but you know, and it's got something times P2, right? And the same kind of for any other clients, for P P2, like it has, it wants P2, and this client wants P2, it has P1 and P3 and sign information, so forth, right? So when we're doing this mean-round minimization, we find the spaces that will satisfy each client in this right, uh, system, right? Because each client will have some vector from this linear space from which it can decode the packets and things, right? So therefore, this mineral problem, it's basically optimal size of the scalar linear code over GFP. So that's a good question, right? Right, and, um, and basically scalar solution, right? So, so vector solution we can potentially do better, but we can also encode vector as a mineral. It will just kind of really, uh, kind of more entities, right? And uh, so this is basically kind of another representation of this problem as mineral. And actually, mineral was studied by mathematicians 
Again, long ago, that uh, kind of some uh, Peter Coopers from uh, Holland, right? So he studied this um, much before that was interest to those problems. Okay, and um, yeah, this is basically just the same that uh, we have this uh, matrix completion, and this might be a solution to this problem. So uh, this will be this basis, and every client here can use one of them to decode what we need. Okay, um, so what we established that uh, optimal might be lower than min run, and lower, so it's basically min run upper bound uh, the number of transmissions, because in general, as I mentioned, if we use some nonlinear coding, uh, we can do even better than in run, but we can use scalar linear coding, we can also do better in some instances. Okay, so let's try to think about other bounds, and let's try us to restrict us to the special case, because this case is uh, uh, kind of hard enough, and we should have bidirected graph as kind of a uh, very, very restrictive case, but still kind of interesting because of its elegance, and we should is kind of just represented by a cyclic graph, and the assumption is that if I know something that uh, another node uh, needs, right, so this node also will know what I need, right? So we basically, instead of two bidirected arcs, it's just represented by an undirected arc, right? So if you have this, as I mentioned, one of the solutions to this is basically to uh, cover it with clicks, right? So we basically, uh, each click here, so click is will be a subgraph of this graph, which is fully connected. So for example, if I, in this graph, uh, the maximum click is of size uh, 3, right? So, for example, those nodes P1, P2, P4, and P5, they form a click because they're fully connected. So, if I'm sending a combination of this node, just P2, P4, and P5, it will satisfy all of them. So, in this one transmission, I kill those three birds, right? And uh, then uh, I just need to find another click, in this case, it's P1 and P3, to do this, right? So, in this case, actually, it's a click cover. Uh, again, click cover is finding a set of clicks that cover all nodes in the system. And in this case, this click cover uh, will be its optimal solution, but it's not necessarily the case in general. Therefore, in click covers, they actually can be larger than minimum. And we all kind of, you can think about this uh, finding an instance which is actually true. So, and then we can have the following inequality. So, um, so first of all, um, uh, we have uh, u prime as a uh, scalar solution, so scalar solution will be lower equal to sorry u prime as a uh, vector linear solution, uh, which will be lower or equal than uh, linear uh, scalar solution. Scalar solution will be equal to min run. Uh, min run of q will be lower or equal than min run two. It's just special case we restrict ourselves to GF two, and min run two will be lower or equal than click cover. Right? Yes. So technically, we do it sending two each for each click. Each for each click for this example. In the way that I would say you could also have sent P3 plus P5 points <coughs> down and make a big click and then send everything. Okay, so let's see. Uh, P3 plus P5? Yes, so that you make a line between them. How we can make a line? You can make lines. Oh. If, I, if I send that information, then P3 is going to know about P5. Oh, okay. P5 is going to know about P3. Okay. The other one are just going to wait, but they will wait anyways in terms of. No, no, so this node doesn't know P3. I mean the the, the, the transmitter. The transmitter. So, okay, okay. Let, let's analyze this, right? So you're basically saying if you want to transmit P3 plus P5. Yes. Okay, so this node will not uh, this node requires P3, right? So it's will get like just it will not really be an H because yes. an H we put when it's low P5. But, but what I know is but what I mean is that then P5 is going to know P3. No, it's not. It's not. Because this node, this node requires P5, it doesn't know. Ah, ah, he doesn't. Ah, okay, I understand. So when you give him the information, he throws it away if he doesn't want it. Ah, it's not necessarily, right? Sometimes you can utilize this, right? Because so, like, if you wanted to keep it, he could keep it, and yeah. you would have a line there, yeah, yeah. and then you could send sure, sure. some Some to everyone. Yeah, exactly. And you would also have it in two pieces. Yeah, sure, it's, it's possible. Okay, let's actually analyze this. But yes. before we say that, uh, click cover is not necessarily the optimal solution, yes. Yes. and not necessarily unique solution, right? Yes. So it's just a solution, right? Yes. Yeah. So it's kind of how it's different actually from click cover. Just want to know if I, what I say. Is okay, but let's see yeah. what is your solution. Let's I'm just try. I'm not understanding the question because I think the model there's some there's some difference in the model that you are you are thinking because. How can you send P3? Who sends P3 plus P5? There is no, there is no mega person who knows. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. There is. There is. There is somebody who knows everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the whole problem. There is yeah, a problem. Yeah, this is the setting of this problem. Oh, okay. Right? Yes, okay. There is a problem. Yes. Okay. 
it's possible to send between yeah. once yeah. because we have, as I mentioned at the beginning. So then you can add the okay. Yeah, simple problem was to manage the computers, but it's important to, yeah, for something. Yeah. This one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So what is your solution, right? So let's see. Did you ask me So Okay. Let's, first, yeah, let's, let's first go with this solution, okay. and then just go back to your reaction. I will give the triple P5. Okay. Then P5, I'm assuming P5 will be interested, and you will keep P3. Yeah, yeah, it's still keep P3 is going to keep P5. Okay. So oh. now the next drawing is going to be a, the same graph in terms of knowledge, but P3 connected to P5. Oh, no, it's not connected to P5. Yeah, that's the music. Okay, so let's kind of reiterate this model. So this graph means each node will correspond to a node, each node in this graph will correspond to a client that requires this packet. He requires P5. I require P5. But to he's connected to P4 because he knows P4. He knows P4 and knows P2. If, if, if I send P2 plus P5 to him, he's going to know P3. No. 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 He doesn't know P3. No. 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 Okay, that's no. So this node, it uh, requires P5, but it's knows P2. <laughs> And before. Yes. So if you send him this, you will just add it to his side information. P3, yes. No, 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 no. But he can. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm hoping. Yeah, yeah, it's going to keep it, yeah. The intuition is correct, right? So hopefully, it's going to be more of something like Okay? But your intuition is correct. <laughs> Sometimes click cover, sometimes you can do those tricks and actually be beneficial, right? So basically what a click cover does is what we call okay, right. So I should send just P5 and then send the sub. That's the No but if you the, 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 no, but if you send P5 I send sub to everyone. Not uh, uh, P3 will not be happy, right? So the idea is to make everybody happy. No, right? but then P3 will go to C5. Oh, you send P5? Yes. Okay, so you send P5, now P3 knows P5. P5 is happy, and then you can send the sum. No, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 no
And this is basically an answer to this natural question. When you can look on those inequality, if they tight or not, if there are instances of graphs in which uh, those inequality might not be necessarily tight, and which instances of graphs this will be tight, and stuff like this, and what are the gaps between those two, right? For example, can we bound? If I'm using this heuristics of click color, because it's related to coloring, people developed a lot of heuristics, right? If you're just interested in a practical solution, right? Because coloring is also hard problem, it's also really hard, but people developed some solution for that. So suppose I don't want to kind of do any complicated coding, and coloring has an advantage that we can immediately decode, we don't need to keep combinations, right? Uh, so what is the gap, for example, between this and this? And any two, kind of what is the gap between uh, scalar linear and, uh, and, um, and vector linear? What is the gap between non-linear and scalar linear, right? So you see like you can publish like at least like 10 papers just doing this, right? So just kind of instead of, a kind of interesting questions, right? It's very long people. Okay, and for example, one of the papers was dealt with uh, special types of graph and uh, establish those connections. And another paper actually was very, very interesting paper using some sort of kind of notion of graph theory, it's not that long, uh, group. They basically try to answer the question, what is the gap between um, um, between a small field size and large field size, right? So for example, is there any instances that will kind of have a, a very small solution uh, with this kind of uh, field size of two, and will have a really large solution, sorry, very large solution for two and very small solution for large field size. And so uh, they determine that basically that for special types of graph, a sign information graph, roughly looks like a Ramsey graph, right, with a special construction, then for those types of graphs, if you're working or solving this mean rank with characteristic two, you get like very, very close to just trivial case without coding, it's just upper bound, so n is the number of nodes, of course you can solve it without coding by uh, simultaneously, so coding can give you only marginal improvement, but if you look large field, uh, large field then you can be kind of really close to uh, Kind of zero, right? So in this case, n to the epsilon. Okay, and this is kind of interesting gap between those two problems. Another gap between linear and nonlinear, and I also like used a lot of like uh, kind of sophistication to do it, right? It's used actually some notion of linear programming and stuff like this, and they import this problem as a hypergraph. It's a very, very interesting paper. And uh, basically, they showed that uh, nonlinear can outperform linear, right? So basically, the gap between uh, nonlinear and linear. It's uh, huge, right? So it's just almost n. Okay, so it's again for the specific family of the codes, right? So everything here, it's not true in general, but it's kind of like a worst case analysis of a gap between linear and nonlinear code. So another uh, kind of interesting uh, question is the complexity, right? As mentioned here, so is this problem hard or not, right? And you can actually already get a feeling because of its relation to coloring, since coloring is hard. This program was also hard, right? But it is even, in some sense, maybe harder than coloring. And, um, and basically, coloring, again, people looked on it like it's a staple problem for computer scientists. And it's widely known that uh, coloring is hard. Even the graph that can be colored in three colors is hard to color with any uh, constant number of colors. And basically, this can be, um, um, can be um, used to analyze the complexity of uh, index coding problem. So as I said, like index coding problem, it's going to be, uh, so again, like just to emphasize this relation between click color and uh, coloring. So if you look on uh, our side information graph, as I mentioned, it's better to cover it, like our purpose one, one of the solution, at least an upper bound, is try to find two clicks that cover all nodes on this graph. So instead of click cover, I can look on complementary graph. And again, a complementary graph is just uh, switching HH, so if you have an H in the original graph, you will not have an H in complementary graph. And if you have no H, you will have an H in complementary graph. So every click in a side information graph will correspond to an independent set. In, uh, in a complementary graph, an independent set will be colored with the same color. So here, basically, the color covers this independent set with two colors. And this is equivalent of coloring this original graph, uh, covering this original graph with two clicks. So we basically can just reduce it to coloring problem instead of working with the coloring problem. Coloring problem. So for coloring problem, we know that uh, even graph is actually three colorable. It's very hard to find the coloring of size uh, four or above. Um, 
So it's four, it's known as an empty car. Uh, but the color it is officially is uh, any three A colors, uh, three times A colors with A is constant, is actually a hard problem. And it's widely conjectured, it's kind of open problem if it's A is uh, kind of logarithmic. So how we can reduce intuitively, right? Again, it's uh, just in case of scalar, and actually reduction works even for uh, vector linear, and even for nonlinear problem. It's going to be hard, right? And how we do it? Because you know is that if we, um, if we find some coding of small size, we can color it with more colors, right? But still a relatively small number of colors, right? So for example, if we color, uh, if we find an optimal solution for index coding problem with just two transmission and we're working over a small field, for example, GF2, then we have only three combinations, right? Because we can just discard the trivial combination and which all of them will be zeros. So we have three linear combinations and we can use each of those combinations to uh, color some vertices in this graph, right? So, or identify clicks in this graph, right? So how we can do it? Because each node of this graph, as we mentioned, uses one of the linear combinations in this subspace to obtain the packets it needs, right? So if you have multiple nodes, like here, P3 and P4, who use this uh, um, linear combinations, they must be clean, right? This is just an observation, right? And then by using this solution of index coding problem, we can find the coloring which has uh, more colors and solutions here, but if the solution is small, right, the number of colors will be bounded. So we can start with an instance of three color graph and call it as an index coding program, give it to index coding algorithm, and then if index coding algorithm will give us a constant, uh, like very small number of transmissions, independent of number of nodes, we can then know that we can color this graph with a constant number of nodes, which will basically um, contradict this uh, conjecture in computer science, in complexity theory, that it's not possible, right? So this is just kind of an intuition, of course, like a highly many details here, how we can prove that uh, this problem is hard. Okay, another problem, since this problem is hard, so what we can do is kind of just formulate another problem, right? So, because the uh, index coding problem is not only hard, it's hard to approximate. So this looks like a complex problem, but it turns out that it's only hard when the number of transmission is very low, right? So in the complexity theory, actually, when we're talking about complexity of specific problem, you need to kind of find it in worst cases, right? So coloring problem is hard when number of colors is very low, right? So that like graph can be colored with three colors, it's very hard to find something which is kind of approaching to it. But if you're kind of trying to do different types of accounting, it turns out that it's much easier to approximate and actually will be used in practical setting. So one of the approaches is, instead of counting, minimizing the number of transmissions, we can maximize the number of safe transmissions, right? So for example, here, we can say like, um, we have a trivial solution that will give us five transmissions, right? Uh, if we send each packet separately, we'll need to do five transmissions. If we do network coding, in this case, we have three transmissions, so we saved two transmissions. So now, instead of minimizing the number of transmissions, I'm just maximizing the number of safe transmissions. So why it's of interest? Because the optimum actually is the same, the whole both problems are hard. If I solve the both problem optimally, it's going to get me the same solution. But this turns out from the approximation point of view, it's a little bit hard to approximate. And it's not only trivial, but it's just saying an interest of more kind of important for practical setting. Because in practical setting, you're not assuming, it's very unreasonable to assume that number of transmissions are actually very low, right? It's still being kind of more like a very special case. But then kind of typical case, Number of transmission will probably get like saving of 50%, but it's not will be like three optimal transmission and we have like uh, 100 of packets. It's well, probably close to 50. So in this case, uh, approximation for coloring is uh, meaningless, right? Because even factor of two, it's going to be just optimal transmission, right? But in this case, it's uh, maybe like uh, more reasonable to assume what is kind of how much you save. So if we save an optimal, we save 50%. Of transmission, if you're saving like 25, is still good, right? So we're still saving a lot. Okay, so in this case, actually, this problem will uh, relate. Uh, there is some approximation algorithm for this problem. It kind of looks horrible. Approximation ratio, actually, it was not that bad for vector linear, uh, but um, for scalar linear, it's just better to plan. But at least it's better for uh, than for index coding problem, and we can come up with a provable approximation. So it turns out the uh, relation here to graph theoretic problem, which is called cycle packing. And the intuition for this, instead of finding clicks, 
we can find the cycles. And actually, it's kind of more general because it works for uh, undirected network, right? So undirected, sorry, um, undirected network, right? So please, we really need to find like if it's an undirected network, right? You need to find fully connected graph, or in undirected network, you also need to find fully connected subgraphs. That kind of probability of this occurring is quite high and quite low, right? For a large click. Um, of course, like, it depends what kind of random graph. So, uh, but cycles is actually easier to find, and each cycle will save one transmission. So this looks like not a lot, but it's add up. So if you find several disjoint cycles, right, you can save quite a bit of transmissions from um, from this kind of optimal solution. So one cycle, and, uh, and coding here is really, really simple. So for example, for each cycle, you can just send a combination of two packets. So on each uh, uh, transmission, you just combine two packets. Again, it's simple to encode, simple to decode. And then the last arc you don't need to send, so you save like five cycles that includes five edges, you save one transmission because you're just transmitting four linear combinations for the part. Okay, so let's kind of talk about, uh, and uh, basically for this heuristic, what we need to do, we need to find like optimal cycle packing from this network. So try to find as many disjoint cycles as possible, and each cycle will save one transmission, so the total number of transmissions will be equal to the total number of cycles and we can get this approximation on. Okay, so now um, let's compare this program. We have like only uh, 18 minutes um, or less. Uh, so let's compare this program for more general network coding problem. So a network coding problem is much uh, more sophisticated problem in some sense because we have a network topology, right? So we have, uh, again, just a reminder, if you don't have a network coding, so we have a network, right? And we have certain nodes which are senders. For example, here are green nodes. And they have red nodes, which are receivers. And senders needs to send information to different receivers. And in case of multicast, for example, everybody needs to get those packets. In case of multiple unicast, uh, then, uh, kind of, as mentioned, like receivers are interested in a particular sender. So for example, this receiver might be interested in this sender, but not necessarily interested in another sender. Right? And uh, nodes can perform linear combinations. So for example, each node of this network can combine one or more packets received over the incoming links and send those packets over the outgoing right? So how is this related to the index program? And you see that the index program in this case is just a special case, kind of can be sort of just a special case of this um, network coding program. One, why? Because you just consider one bottleneck link, right? So suppose what we have that all links of here in this network have unlimited capacity. Instead of this, except of this red link here, it has a kind of capacity you want to kind of minimize this, use link as, with as minimum capacity as possible. And this actually was uh, kind of just observation of another interesting paper about the relation of index coding to interference alignment problem. And unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about this today. <coughs> Maybe like tomorrow I'll just say why those problems are also pretty much unusual. But uh, first, let's establish this connection to network coding program. So, if we assume again that all links have an unlimited capacity instead of this, instead of this red link, then uh, those packets uh, that are connected uh, between, uh, if there is a path between destination and source, uh, which is not including this backup uh, back, uh, bottleneck link, those links uh, nodes will know like all the sources are silent information, right? Because it doesn't cost us anything to deliver information from this source to this terminal, even if this terminal is not interested in this source, right? So if we are unlucky, I think like in this case this picture is not very good, but suppose I remove this link, right? And suppose there is a node, oh no, actually we have, but suppose this node is uh, interested in this source, right? So there is a, actually there is no pass here. Yeah. I kind of should draw it better, but you can understand, right? So if there is a link, suppose there was a link here uh, between this node and this node, then only pass between this green node and this terminal that goes through this bottom end, right? So this is kind of exactly like an index coding because this link will kind of emulate this broadcast uh, link which is of limited capacity and this node can get the side information from here for free. So this index coding problem can be thought about very, very similar case, simple case of much more general network coding. So what is surprising is that we can actually go in another direction, right? So we can actually encode this more general uh, network coding problem into this index coding problem. So another reduction that can be made, right? So suppose we have an algorithm that solves 
uh, general index uh, network coding problem, right? We can actually construct a reduction from an instance of index coding problem to this problem by kind of just building this network, right? And we all kind of, the rest of today, and maybe some time tomorrow, we'll talk about those reductions. And I think like Michelle, maybe also will talk about this connection between different problems. And actually kind of that's a popular topic, it's called the special section in RTW, to just establish connections. Those problems are hard, but how they are related, right? So they, they um, can be solved by the same algorithm, uh, can um, some capacity region or kind of trade region of this related to the trade region or other problems. It's kind of interesting uh, connections. Okay, and um, so here is the construction is pretty simple, right? So this is an instance of a network the index coding problem. Again, we have transmitter, we have receiver. So now in this case, we'll just build this graph that includes two layers. One layer will correspond to senders. Each sender will associate it with some packet. And then we have uh, receivers, right? So this layer will associate it with receiver. For each receiver node, we'll create a node in this graph. And those green uh, edges will correspond to side information edges, right? So if this node X2 knows about packets X1 and X3, right? So for example, X2 knows X1 and X3, we'll create those green edges, right? So this um, packet will receive those um, information about X1 and X3. So those three edges, and uh, you can just unlimited capacity or capacity of this edge is kind of um, enough for transmitting those packets. And then uh, a broadcast channel is basically um, modeled by this bottleneck link. And now all of those senders are connected to those black edges to this bottleneck edge. And the tail node, uh, sorry, head node of this tail, uh, bottleneck link, edge is connected to those um, receiver nodes. So it's kind of pretty uh, simple to see that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we still have 12 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, and you can see that this reduction is kind of pretty straightforward, right? So it's, yeah, basically, you have uh, uh, kind of um, if we can find a solution for this problem, right? We can use the same encoding that we use for this bottleneck link to send this coded packet from the transmitter, right? And uh, why is this kind of possible, right? So there is basically it's very easy to make a reduction from this uh, index coding program to this uh, network. Okay, any questions here? Okay, so now let's actually try to build reduction in another direction, right? So in another direction, it's will be much harder, right? Because here we have a network that has a certain topology, right? So we're starting with this bottleneck, uh, sorry, bottle network, as uh, Danilo mentioned, it's kind of like the simplest network coding instance that we can imagine, just for the purpose of demonstration, right? So in this network, we have two senders, X1 and X2, and we have two receivers. And uh, this receiver is interested in this packet X2, and this receiver is interested in X1, right? And we have uh, seven edges in this network. And actually, in this network, only one edge is actually can do coding X3, uh, E3, because all other edges uh, don't have enough information to do any meaningful coding. But we'll just kind of represent them just to build a reduction in general case. OK, so, um, so basically, I'm giving an instance of this problem that includes a network, right? So a set of receivers, set of senders, who is interested in more, and I want to build an instance of this uh, index coding problem. So in index coding problem, I don't have a topology, right? So I just have a relay node, and I have a bunch of receivers. So the way to encode this topology, I need to kind of create special receivers that will force the solution of this problem to be a feasible solution of this problem. So now constructions that I'm presenting is just for linear, right? Because it's just easy to understand, but people extended this construction for scalar linear and even non-linear. So it's probably kind of it requires of course a lot of more like work and uh, uh, to do this, right? It's basically the same principles, but to show equivalence you need to uh, kind of in terms of proofs, you need to do much more work. So the idea is basically again, uh, given this instance, try to uh, have a built an instance to this uh, um, index coding problems that uh, will force this receiver to create some solutions that will be also useful for this, right? So if I solve this, I will solve this as well, as said, but, uh, which I kind of hope to make, right? So, so the first uh, question when we're building instance of this index coding program is to decide which packets we we'll have, right? So we have two types of packets. One will be blue packets that will correspond to senders. 
So we have two senders x1 and x2, so we we'll create a set of x of uh, two blue packets. And then we have packets that will correspond to edges of this network. And this will be the set of those uh, uh, seven red packets. OK, so this will be set of packets of this network. So now what we want to do, we want to create uh, senders, right? So now we can have a freedom to uh, have different clients that have different side information. And uh, those clients, again, they need to kind of decide on them such that that um, solution we send um, will kind of be useful for network. So any solution here will be a combination of blue packets and red packets, right? So obviously, right, this is packets we have. So one sender that we introduce here, it will be more, much more as just first sender, the uh, first lines that we introduce. It will uh, have all green packets, all, it's actually all uh, X packets, let's put it look here, right? So it will have all of those packets, and it will, will want all of the red packets, right? So it, this client will force certain constraint on, um, on, uh, on the code, on the index code, right? Because for this sender to, re, uh, for, to decode, right, it must have the solution, optimal solution to index coding problem must have this form, right? Because uh, if you kind of uh, look in from this, right, so the optimal solution will be kind of a matrix which have two parts, right? So one of them will be uh, um, y part, so y part is probably going to be larger than x part, so it's going to be y packets and there will be x packets, right? And, uh, and uh, the, the optimal transmission must be of size at least y because this uh, first uh, receiver is wants y packets. And uh, any solution that you give me to this index coding problem, right, it must be like this metric because this uh, node knows x. So it basically can eliminate this matrix, right? And it might must be able to diagonalize this part, right? Because it knows y, right? So it requires y, right? So basically it should be able to extract from the linear combination sent over the channel. It must be able to extract y if it's knows x. So it can substitute all x's. It can um, kind of perform the row operations to diagonalize uh, this part of this matrix. Therefore, the optimal solution after I diagonalize, I just change the basis, right? It can look like this, right? Do you agree with me? This is basically the first. Uh, so basically, kind of the purpose of introducing this client. Again, you might need some technical details, but at least you get some intuition. The pr purpose of this client is kind of to shape this optimal solution, right? So once we do this, we add another client such that those uh, functions here, right? So each transmission will be kind of some packets from kind of this diagonalized set and some combination of x's, right? Because when we diagonalize it twice, <coughs> we get some entries here. So this will be this function as a corresponding to h1 and stuff like this, right? So function of v1 and the next will be function of v2 and so forth. So the function of a1, I want to introduce additional clients such that the function of a1 will be useful for encoding function for this edge, right? And this will be true for every edge in the network, right? So basically, I kind of, and it's not necessarily true now, right? Because now we, we have just one line, doesn't want to, like, doesn't make sense to send x at all, but I just want to introduce another client with the goal that those edges will be uh, useful as an encoding edges on this network. So how we do it? So, um, uh, so what we uh, have for each node on this network, we will introduce an additional client. So it's actually for each edge in the network, sorry. So for each edge of the network, we will introduce an additional client. In this case, we'll just show this additional client, which is introduced for this edge E3. And this client will require Y of E3, and it's uh, have, okay, so because we have a freedom, right, to construct this instance as we want. So it will require Y3, and it's have um, packets y e1 and y2 as a side input, right? So now this client will force uh, the function uh, f of e3 to be an encoding function of this node. Okay, so how, uh, what it needs to be done to show this? To show this, uh, to, for this function to be a feasible encoding function, this function must be linear combination of those two, right? Because it's still be feasible a network coding function, right? Because this uh, it's kind of like a global encoding function of packets. If you kind of think about uh, packets transmitted here, it will be a kind of a linear combination of x1 and x2. But this cannot be arbitrary linear combination because this, uh, it's outgoing page of not one. So it must be some combination of, uh, of a combinations that send of edges e1 and e2. So basically, to, for this function to be a feasible function, 
right? You need to make sure that this function is a combination of E1 and, uh, sorry, Y of E1 and, sorry, uh, this function F of E3 must be a combination of e for F of E1 and F of E2. So how we can make it sure, right? Because if this client wants a tree, right? So, and it has E1, uh, Y of E1 and Y of E2, it actually can go ahead and substitute Y1 into this transmission and Y2 into this transmission. So all other transmissions will be useless, right? So, you follow me, I lost me completely. Okay, so some people will follow me. Right, so basically I'm kind of just this client, right, all other, uh, so basically, okay, so I have that for me, so I'll just explain it a little bit in more detail. So as we mentioned, like what we do first, we diagonalize this, right? So this is basically dependence on, on y. Okay, so each node, like for example here, it will be a combination of y e1 plus some function of x. So if this node requires one e3 and need and it has y e1 and y e2, okay, it will only be interested in this row and second row and third row. Why row number four will be not of interest to this node? Because it's contaminated, it's Y of E4, right? And this node doesn't have it, and it's not requiring it. So it will not be this uh, kind of all other nodes, will not be complete, completely useless for this node. Right, so, and therefore this node will only be kind of using those combinations. So for those combinations, since it knows Y of E1 and Y of E2, it can go ahead and substitute here, Y1 and Y2, and this way it's obtaining knowledge of of this function of H1 and function of H2. Now, only way it can decode, because it's interested in decoding Y3, if F of E3 is actually a combination, right? So you see here, like, kind of, kind of how it relates to interference alignment, right? So those kind of interfering functions, they need to align, right? Because this, um, those kind of, like, in interferences, they need to kind of perfectly align here, so this node can decode it, right? So this is how this reduction is built. So uh, this actual client is just ensures that each uh, kind of uh, function here is a linear combination of those two, right? And we also need to do some additional work to make sure that, um, that each terminal can decode, but it can be done in a very, very similar way. Okay, so this is, yeah. I don't know why should be linear coverage should be non-linear too. No, this is reduction for linear, right. But at this point, you could see. Yeah, yeah, this can be extended for non-linear, but. Uh, uh, it's a similar idea, so right now I presented just uh, for linear reduction, right? So any linear solution for uh, index coding will solve linearly uh, necropoly just for simplicity. But uh, Michelle actually and Michael, they extended it recently with Salish. Um, they extended it recently to uh, non-linear. Uh, using the same principle, of course, we need to kind of take care of it. I think I think it will be done here, right? So we kind of close to the end and people will tired. So unless there are questions, then we kind of wrap up here and continue tomorrow. Thanks again for coming. Thanks for asking questions.